Hello, how's everybody doing? Seven o'clock on Tuesday. We are ready to get started right on the nose. Um, how's everyone doing? How's, how's it going out there? And how um, is everyone enjoying this group? And are you getting the support that you're looking for from this group and this page? Um, just kind of getting a feel, checking in on how everyone's doing and uh, how things are going for you guys. Um, I know I've mentioned this before, but I absolutely love, love, love going live um, just to answer these questions. I just, you know, this is something I've wanted to do for so long, which is to help others. And I have been practicing the principles of functional medicine for over 15 years, but I just never kind of got my act together and, and uh, you know, not, I didn't get my act together because I was really always doing classes and always, um, you know, furthering my education, but I just didn't know if I could do it or not. And then um, turns out that, of course, then I got sick for quite a few years. And that was the little gentle butt kick I needed to kind of um, get myself out there and heal and go through some very, very tough years. And so then I made a promise to myself that when I got better, I would be helping everybody um, as best as I could. And um, I applied to the functional medicine practitioner program and I got accepted about a year ago and I am more than halfway through, um, have a few more modules left and then there's a pretty big exam and a case report for six months that you follow a patient and stuff like that. So. Yeah, it's a little bit of a long road, but for me, this has been amazing just with my 15 years of, you know, whatever certifications and classes that I've done in the field of functional medicine um, to really be able to come out here and help people best I can um, and, you know, at least provide an educational resource of what people, usually you would pay hundreds of dollars to get to a functional medicine doctor. Um, I, you know, my advice does not substitute at all for uh, medical advice, but it's just an educational platform of things that you can do to help your healing journey, how you can help yourself, how you can really start feeling better, especially when you're feeling so sick. So really more of just an educational platform, you know, health and wellness, diet and nutrition, um, that kind of stuff. So I love, love, love that you guys are sending the questions. Um, keep the questions coming. The only thing I request is where I put the um, the graphic for um, the Q&A. Please write your questions underneath there um, because I try my best, but the, the, face has, the Facebook group has grown so much and it's just gotten so busy with so many comments that sometimes I can't sift through and find um, questions. So make sure that you um, put the questions underneath the Q&A um, image that I put on every Friday. Um, I think I put a reminder on Monday. So, you know, please make sure to put the questions underneath there so I can get to them. Um, looks like we've got a few people signed on and tell me, tell me just a little hi and where you guys are from and, you know, things like that. Um, but we'll get started as well. So you, you know, obviously I made the disclaimer, this is not to substitute for medical advice at all. This is an educational platform to really help you um, educate and train on the um, principles of functional medicine and, and really just to promote a healthier lifestyle, diet, nutrition, health and wellness, you know, any kind of modalities, meditations, things like that. Um, I said this last time, and I'm say this again, because I think between last week and this week, we've grown probably another um, over 100 new members have joined. And if you are watching these lives, then please make sure to um, watch the other lives first. I think I've done six or seven already um, since we do them every Tuesday night. Um, and the reason I say that is because they kind of follow each other, especially the first three or four kind of follow each other, not only from my journey, but also my illness. And then really step-by-step step, things that I feel that were important um, to educate you guys on and then to really promote a healthy lifestyle. So um, if you haven't already, they're pinned on the top of the page. You can just, you know, scroll all the way to the right, get to the very first one, which I believe was on March 27th. Um, and then from that point on, one every week. So make sure to watch those videos out first. Um, and then the other thing is I'm really, really excited. I hope you guys had a chance to 
see the um, 10 steps guide that I made up and posted. And hopefully you guys had a chance to download it. I mean, I can't, I can't stress this enough. Like literally guys, those are the 10 steps I use to heal myself. So if you haven't already done so, download that guide because that is a step-by-step -step how I started. And when I was completely bedridden, I was bedridden for quite a while, the, some of those things are the only things that I could do. And over the years, as I started healing very little progressively, very slowly, I would still do those 10 principles, but I was each one, I was progressively upping. Um, whatever it was that I was doing, I was upping it. And so just be sure to make sure that you download that guide, especially if you're very sick and you don't know where to start. Um, I put some links in there. The, the, the things that are in blue are hyperlinks. So I put some links in there, you know, the, the exact meditations, the exact protocols, the exact um, things that I use to heal. Um, and you can, um, I can, someone said about the posting the link here. So let me see if I can copy and paste it. Um, thank you, David, for that. He says, awesome 10 step guide. I'm just going to post the link there. Um, and Deb says she's from Florida Keys. Oh, I am jealous that you are in the Florida Keys. And then Portia's from Connecticut. Um, David is from Northern California. Um, David says he went back and watched the first live again today. Oh, that's wonderful. I mean, I just, you know, it's so much information and trust me, I know this coming from illness, coming from cognitive decline, sometimes you just don't grasp all of it at one time and so you really need to watch or read things a couple of times and there are books that I've read three times because each time over the years I've gotten a different message um, from the book because you just gather different things so awesome job David that you went back and watched it and Rosalie says she's from Maine hi Katie so all right so after we've done some of that stuff let's uh, go ahead and get started here um, Deb asks, does detox from mold make you feel lousy? And what is lactic acid? Why does it build up in muscles? And how do you get rid of it? Um, so let's address each of those questions because that's multiple questions. Um, does detox from mold make you feel lousy? Absolutely. Um, you know, the mold, the um, they're coming out of your fat cells, things that are stored, the toxins and everything that's stored in your fat cells and in your organs is now coming out into the bloodstream and it doesn't want to come out. It makes you feel like crap. And when it comes out too, it's really causing an inflammatory process because it's kind of circulating in your blood. Um, and so yes, it'll make you feel very lousy. Um, one thing that I'm going to quickly say, I've addressed the, the detox pathways quite a few times before, but you know, you really need to make sure that your phase two detox channels are open first before you do phase one. Um, and so what is phase one and phase two? I think I talked about it um, quite a bit of detail on the April 5th live. Um, but basically phase one is where, you know, these toxins are taken from being fat soluble and made into water soluble. And then phase two is from, you know, water soluble. It is then taken out of the body, um, into the bloodstream, and then out of the body. So you really want your phase two channels open because otherwise what you're going to do is just keep circulating all those phase ones, you know, from fat soluble to water soluble. It's just going to keep circulating in your blood and it's going to make you feel very, very lousy. Um, as far as what is lactic acid, lactic acid is produced um, by the muscles and red blood cells and it's formed when the body breaks down carbohydrates for energy when oxygen is low. So when can oxygen be low? If you're in a, you know, you have some kind of a lung disorder or if you're exercising and you're in a, you know, hypoxic um, state. So that's when you really start producing lactic acid, which unfortunately is very common with um, people who have um, a chronic illness. So the body usually clears lactic acid but cannot keep up if the levels are really high. Um, so if you really exercise too much or um, if you have, you know, detoxification problems or anything like that, then the body's not able to get rid of this um, lactic acid. So how do you get rid of it? So if you are exercising, one of the things to do is to 
do really deep breathing when you're exercising because then what you're doing is really providing more oxygenation to your muscles and your cells and things like that and so even though the carbohydrates are being broken down um, to convert to lactic acid um, you're still giving that enough oxygen to your muscles and your bones and your cells and things like that to minimize how much lactic acid is produced um, you can do light movement after exercise or for me um, the next day. In fact, my kids always give me such a hard time because they'll do some kind of weight training or something and then they're really sore the next day and I'm like, oh, we got to get moving today. And so the next day I'll always have them walk or, you know, do a light jog around the neighborhood or something like that because when you do that light movement after exercise, you're really just circulating and, and getting that lactic acid from being really um, stuck in there in the muscles and cells and things like that. So light movement after exercise is really good. Even gentle yoga, gentle walking, anything to really keep that circulation going. Uh, for me, like I do breath work every morning. Um, and so that's been very beneficial in my healing journey. I've cut down a little bit now, but I used to do quite a bit before, um, especially the first four years when I was very sick. I did breath work first thing in the morning at 5 a.m. Um, and then I would meditate. Um, and that really helps with vagus nerve stimulation, but then also getting that lactic acid out of there. And then, like I said, I walk the next day, um, especially if I have exercise and I'm pretty sore. Um, the other thing that I did, especially when I was really sick and if I attempted to even walk or, you know, do something physical and I really felt horrible after I came back and I just, my muscles were done, I felt exhausted and wiped out, so then I would do the infrared blanket right after exercise. Guys, I can't even tell you, that is the only way that I got through my first year when I started kind of being physical again after being so sick for so long. My first year that I started being physical again, walking again, like I said, I would walk the neighborhood and it's 1.8 miles, you know, but I would just be so sore and so wiped out within those 30 minutes. And so the only way for me to get rid of it was to do the infrared blanket right after I got back. And it would help so much because it really helps with inflammation. It helps with bringing fresh blood to the muscles. And so then kind of takes that lactic acid away. Uh, and then I would do a cold plunge or a cold bath um, or shower or whatever. And, you know, that's really beneficial as well. So those are the steps that I did to help myself, especially when I was initially starting to work out. Um, the infrared blanket, I've talked about it before, higher dose is the one I use until this day. I still have it five years later and I still use it. Um, really like it. Um, and then the other thing I will say I was talking to a physical therapist the other day and we were talking about liver and how like congested my liver was at, at that time and things like that. And, you know, she was saying that one of the reasons she felt back then that I couldn't even exercise much was because of this lactic acid production because of a sluggish liver. So the liver really is, you know, the one that helps kind of circulate and get all that lactic acid out of there and move it out. Um, and so she felt back then that my liver was so congested and I wasn't able to really get all that lactic acid out. Um, and so I think I mentioned this as well before, but for me, this was a huge game changer. I did liver flushes. I did seven liver flushes and then I did my eighth one in January and I'm going to get ready to do another one in May. So now I'm on a maintenance program, but I did seven liver flushes every month. You do one. And then, um, after that, it's just maintenance that I'm doing every four months or so. And I'll be very honest, like for me, I hated doing those liver flushes and it was so difficult for me. But it after the third or fourth one, I started having so much more energy. I started losing weight, um, you know, and if you've seen all these talks, like all these Q and A's that we've done, I think I've mentioned the liver like 30 times already. Everything that the liver is responsible for from detoxification to hormonal, you know, detoxing hormones and toxins and all of this stuff. I have mentioned the liver so many times. So here someone asks a question about lactic acid and the liver comes into play again. It's just to show you how much the liver does. Our liver is just like this phenomenal organ and how much it does. And so when I was talking to the PT um, last week, she's a physical therapist, and we were talking about how just sluggish my liver was. I mean, I couldn't tolerate anything. I couldn't tolerate three drops of distilled water on my tongue. That's how bad I was um, herxing or I couldn't detox or just, it was just terrible. So 
the liver flushes, um, when my naturopath, who is a dear friend of mine also, brought it up to me, I was so, I was so like, oh my God, I can't believe I have to do this. And after the third one, I really started seeing a difference. So I recently convinced my husband, who is just not a big fan of a lot of this stuff, you know, and I just convinced him recently. And it took a little bit of convincing, but he's already done six. And this is a guy who doesn't do a lot of this stuff. He's done six and he's got one more to go. Um, and, you know, he's just doing really well. So I, uh, I'm i gonna put the link here again. Um, again, this is the same company, like I said, I am affiliated with them and um, they um, have the cleanest liver flush out there, in my opinion. Um, I had done a lot of research and I just, there was no company that I could tolerate the, tolerate the products, the supplements, everything. My body was rejecting everything and their liver flush I could actually do and I really, really liked it. Um, even glutathione, in the beginning I could not tolerate any glutathione. It was not till I was so much better that I could actually tolerate glutathione and that was a couple of years after that. Um, and so, you know, it's just, uh, the liver flushes for me were just amazing. And the other thing that, you know, some people do is liver detox diets. I've never done them. I know that there's quite a few doctors out there that have a very specific diet that they promote um, for liver detox. I think Medical Medium has a really good liver detox diet. Uh, I've never done them. It, for me, restricting diet is just so difficult, especially as a vegetarian. You know, I was vegan, gluten-free. Like, it's just so tough for me. Um, when I was really sick, I was very, very strict vegan and gluten-free. I still am gluten-free, um, and I think I'm 99% vegan, really. But um, for me, restricting diets is just very difficult, especially when you're so sick and you have very limited calories that these diets have. So I never tried the liver detox diet, but I know people who really... Um, liked it and enjoyed it and find it a lot easier to do that than to do um, a liver flush. And then the other thing is coffee enemas um, are also very, very good to, there is so much research out there. There is so much uh, on coffee enemas. And I think if I remember the statistic correctly, I had read this a couple of months ago. Um, when you do a coffee enema, you increase naturally the production of glutathione by 3000% in your body. So it's just something that is just touted by functional medicine doctors and, and naturopaths and, and a whole bunch of um, practitioners that really do um, like um, coffee enemas. I am going to put a link down here. There is a biohacker that I have followed for um, quite a few years, and he um, came out this, with this really good article. His name is Ben Greenfield, and he came out with this really good article about coffee enemas and the benefits of them. He's also a big proponent of it. So I'm putting them out there. I'm just gonna give you all these different options. Like if you are having you know, a sluggish liver and you're not able to kind of um, move that lactic acid, then these are many options that you can do. I hope that answers your question. That was a really long-winded answer. Um, and Deb also asked, not sure if you got this question, how do you know if your body is detoxing and eliminating? I remove myself from mold exposure and I'm on glutathione, a binder, infrared sauna. I feel worse than before. My functional doctor had me start at 160 for 30 minutes. I think this is too much. Do you have to sweat to be beneficial? Okay, quite a few questions again. So. Let's kind of tackle these one at a time. So how do you know if your body is detoxing and eliminating? Your, your channels will be open. All your detox channels will be open. So, you know, whether you're urinating frequently and, and your urine is coming out almost clear, which is good. Um, and then your um, bowel movements every single day, at least once a day, if not twice a day, um, you're sweating, you know, things like that. Then you know your body is detoxing and you're eliminating. Um, you also do some detoxification through respiration when you inhale and exhale. Um, so those are different channels for which you know you can detox. She says she removed herself from mold, um, which is good. And I'm on glutathione, a binder, infrared sauna, and I feel worse than before. So, you know, well-meaning practitioners, they all mean really well. Even the ones that I started working with very early on. The thing is they put me on 
25 different supplements all at one time. And here I am, someone who's very, very, very sensitive. Um, like I said, I couldn't even tolerate three drops of um, distilled water. So when they give me 25 different supplements, I am reacting to everything. Um, and so for me, my functional medicine doctor also started me on glutathione, and it was so difficult for me to handle. Not only did it give me like severe right upper quadrant pain, kind of where my liver and gallbladder is, but I was just blurry all the time, like cognitive decline, because I felt like it was just detoxing, but my channels were not open. Um, and so you're doing glutathione and a binder and infrared sauna, even the binders in the beginning made me feel miserable. Right off the bat, she put me on well call um, and I felt miserable on it. She wanted me to be on like four a day and I could barely tolerate one, maybe two sometimes. So you're saying you think this is too much. I would have the conversation with your practitioner because for me, when they started me on all that stuff, it was a lot. I couldn't tolerate any of it. I was a really sick person, very sensitive to everything. Um, and so, and then the other thing you said is your functional medicine doctor had you start, I believe you, you were talking about the infrared sauna 160. 160, I'm assuming is the temperature um, for 30 minutes. I mean, that seems like a lot to me too. I, when I started initially detoxing, um, with the infrared red blanket, I was in the lowest setting, like one. It, the one I have is that goes zero to nine, so it doesn't have temperature. Um, but I think I was on like one. And the first time I did it, I think I could only handle like five minutes. Not because it was too hot, I just couldn't handle it. I felt so sick. And I remember the time that I got up to four, like on the numbers, um, I got up to four and I did 10 minutes and I was wiped out, wiped out. Um, and so, yes, it is a little too much. I mean, 30 minutes in general for a sauna, I think is a lot, um, especially for sick people. But, you know, again, this is a conversation you need to have with your practitioner because it really needs to be dialed down to what you can handle. This is another reason why I wanted to start this page and start these lives, because unless you have gone through it yourself, you will not understand how sick you feel and how every little thing has a reaction and how sensitive you are. Because it's very easy for me as a practitioner to say, okay, do X, Y, Z, and these many supplements, and do this, and do this sauna, and do this, you know. It's very easy to do that on paper. But if you're really, really sick, and if you're someone who's like as sensitive as me, where I was having so much sensitivities to everything, then a protocol like that would be way too much for me. And the one that my practitioner put me on, well-intended, like very, very good practitioner, it's a lot. I couldn't handle it. Now, as my as my background of, of you know practicing the principles of functional medicine for 15 years, I really knew what to cut down on and I knew what to scale back on. And I knew when I felt really sick. I mean, I could have never done. I, I don't think I can still do 30 minutes of a sauna um, because that's just a lot. I mean, my max I think I've gotten to is about 16 or 17 minutes. Now, I don't know the temperature because I do it at the gym now. Um, but yeah, I just, that seems like a lot for 30 minutes. You're really gonna be dehydrated. You're gonna overheat your muscles. And especially if you're not feeling well, then you've got weak adrenals. Um, it's a, you know, it's just a tough, tough thing to deal with for 30 minutes. So, and then the last question was, do you have to sweat to be do you have to sweat to be beneficial? Yeah, for the infrared, I mean, can I tell you guys, I did not sweat at all for the first six months um, when I started doing those infrared blankets. I didn't get it. I didn't understand why I'm in this heat and I'm in a blanket like wrapped up in this cocoon and I'm not sweating. And I just was just shocked, you know, but I didn't sweat at all. And that to me just probably signified even more how my detox channels were not open at all. I was going around and touting the fact that I hadn't used deodorant in maybe like three, four years prior to that. I mean, that to me should have been a telltale sign that I'm not detoxing because I wasn't sweating at all. And I was like, oh, I don't need um, deodorant anymore because I don't sweat. And it was a lot. Um, and so, yes, I did not sweat for a long time. And that's another reason to kind of cut down on the time because if you're not sweating, it's really you overheating your body. Um, now, did I start sweating? Yes, I started sweating. I remember the first day I started sweating and I took a shower and I went downstairs and I told my husband, I said, I think I sweated today. Like I was sweating and I had a little bit of sweat on my back and I was just so excited um, because that's the, um, 
that's when one of the first times I started sweating after really doing the infrared blanket for over six months before I got any sweat. Um, and then the other thing, um, like I said, they started me on well call and I just had a really tough time with it. And I did it for about maybe six or seven months. And then I started working with a um, shoemaker certified practitioner and who practices the shoemaker protocol. And he actually doubled my dose of Walcol. And I felt even worse. Um, I think my functional medicine practitioner had me on four. Um, and then my, um, the new, the shoemaker protocol physician that I started working with, I think he had me on like six or seven, I can't remember. So not double, but you know, 1.5 times that. Um, and I felt even worse. And I could only tolerate that entire shoemaker protocol for maybe six months. Um, so for me, this again, is just for me, instead of oil call, what I tolerated better um, was Super Carbon 60. And so again, same link. Um, I will put that um, link again if you guys want. Again, like I said, my family and I, use these products for seven years before I came became affiliated with them. But they have this amazing liver flush system that is just awesome. And so I used that. Um, and then their SC60, Super Carbon 60 is, um, I'm gonna write it here, sorry. SC60 and liver flush um, system. Those are the two that I used. The SC60 is a super carbon 60, so it's basically like a supercharged carbon, um, nanocarbon that is really, really helpful with um, detoxing. And so I was able to handle that better. And this is just my experience, guys, but I was so blurry and so like having so much cognitive decline on that, on the binders and fuzzy all the time, like brain on fire, couldn't think. For me, I really like the SC60 better. I would take it first thing in the morning with my probiotics, and then you know, 20 minutes later or so, I would do my lemon water with salt. Um, and it just, I literally used to feel clarity. I used to do it twice a day morning, and then I would do it at 5 p.m. before I ate dinner, because you always want your binders 30 minutes before you eat a meal. Um, and so I just really felt that I could, just, I could see clear, I could think clear. So for me, the SC60 was a lot better um, than, um, than being able to tolerate the binders. And uh, even now, like if I have a really busy weekend, um, I think I put like when I travel or whatever, like if I'm, you know, I eat out a lot or anything like that, if I'm just eating out all weekend, then I take the SC60 still. I absolutely love it. My kids take it sometimes. Um, it's just really, really beneficial to help me with detoxing. If I'm feeling really like, you know, I ate out and the oils were not good or whatever, um, you know, or the food is not organic or whatever, then I just come home and I take a uh, SC60 before bed. And it really does help kind of take out those toxins and things that are circulating in my body. So Deb, I hope that answers your question. Um, my goodness, we've spent like 30 minutes on two questions from Deb, but you know, I just, I really like to be thorough and just kind of give you guys the whole rundown. Um, Rosalie asked the best way to turn off fight or flight response. Um, so for those of you that don't know fight or flight response, um, when your body senses danger, and danger could be, oh, there's a tiger in front of me. When your body senses danger, it has one of two options, fight or flight. So either you're gonna fight that tiger uh, and your body's gonna gear up for that fight, or your body's gonna say, no way in heck we're fighting that tiger. We are running. We are flying out of here, like just getting out of here. So fight or flight, um, that's what it is. And your body kind of goes into whichever mode it's going to work on. Um, and so unfortunately, in today's day and age, um, our body is constantly in fight or flight. And it's not because of tigers. It's because of our day-to-day -day stresses that we have. We have stress with our kids. We have stress with our jobs. We have stress with, you know, putting your mom in a nursing home. You have stress with, you know, someone you love getting diagnosed with a, a disease, a terminal disease. I mean, there's just so much. There's COVID. There's just so much stress on a day-to-day -day basis. And so what ends up happening is your body's thinking that it's constantly needing to be in this fight or flight response because it's constantly seeing or sensing that tiger. Um, and so Rosalie, the things that I've used 
um, and continue to use every day are breath work. I do a lot of breath work in the morning. Um, that helps me really to just kind of stimulate my parasympathetic nervous system to really um, stimulate my vagus nerve, you know, things like that to get me out of fight or flight and keep me more in the more relaxed or rest and digest kind of mode, um, which is what we want to be in. Um, walking helps a lot if you're able to walk and go out and walk in nature, um, walking meditation. So today morning, I actually just wanted to do a very, very slow walk and just kind of take it e easy. And so then I just put on my headphones, I went on YouTube and I just looked up walking meditation. And so basically it's like the name implies, it's just you're meditating and you're listening while you're walking and you really try to feel and, um, feel it and just to feel the words and what they're saying. I say walking meditation because I like to be active, but, um, you know, you can just do sitting meditation. You can do chanting. You can do um, guided meditation before bed. I always meditate before bed. I put on my headphones and I meditate before bed. Um, and so you can do guided meditations, but you know, I'm an active person now and I love to be outside and I have two dogs and I was taking them for a walk today. And, um, you know, so I just put on, I was, I was feeling really good in a great mood this morning. I just wanted to walk outside. The weather's been so nice. So I just put on walking meditation today. Um, if you can even tolerate light exercise, like that's actually really, really good um, to get you out of fight or flight. Now you don't want to do like crazy hit training, you know, like really intense exercise that'll kind of put you back in fight or flight because then your body perceives that as stress as well. Um, but just light exercise and, um, you know, yoga, tai chi. I think in one uh, a post on the page early on, I did put some links to tai chi, which or qigong. I actually put links to qigong, but you can do qigong you can do Tai Chi and again YouTube is just amazing for that you just find those um, videos on YouTube you just search them and, and it's just so easy to do um, the other things that you can do is like humming and listening to music so today like when I was doing my walking meditation and I was walking the dogs and stuff there were certain parts where I could hum and I was just you know humming or trying to sing you know really trying to bring out my parasympathetic nervous system and not my fight or flight and then I know people do a lot of tapping. I've done a few classes on EFT tapping where you really tap, you know, the points of the um, vagus nerve. I don't use it on a day-to-day -day basis, so I'm going to just put that out there. But um, I know tapping is really, really helpful. Chanting. I have a friend who does so much tapping and chanting and there's very specific points. You'd have to look it up. I think it's called EFT tapping. It really, really helps to get you out of fight or flight. Um, and then forest bathing. I recently, about a year ago, experienced forest bathing. I was traveling um, somewhere. I had gone to one of like these holistic um, places and I always do these courses and I do a lot of holistic work as well, spiritual and holistic work. I've done this spiritual and holistic work for over, gosh, 18 years or so. So usually once or twice a year, I try to go to you know some place, it's an ashram or it's like a, a location. And I actually went to some place um, last year and for the first time tried forest bathing. I had heard of it before and I kind of practiced it, but this woman was like trained in forest bathing and she, I believe, was a um, horticulturalist before that. So she knew all her plants and her trees and then she had us do this forest bathing. It was one of the most wonderful experiences um, where you really are one with nature and the trees and the like you really feel the energy of that tree and you feel the energy of that space and you feel that healing taking place. And um, I haven't tried this, but I'm sure on YouTube, you can put on some video of forest bathing and then just go to a local trail or a park or something that you have and actually just listen to it and listen to what they're telling you to do. Um, it is really, really beneficial. Um, so I highly recommend all of those things from breath work to meditation, forest bathing, um, walking meditation, humming, EFT tapping. There's quite a few. Listening to music. Like there was, when I was really sick, this is true story guys. When I was so sick, I think it was a four year period where I didn't listen to music, which is so crazy because I've listened to music my whole life and I love music, but I guess I was just so sick and I had so much cognitive decline that I just didn't want to listen to music. And for me, a big indicator a couple years ago that it was actually getting better was that I wanted to listen to music again. I started making playlists on YouTube and 
you know, things like that and like old music, new music, you know, I listened to a lot of classical and Bollywood music and, and I just, it was a big indicator for me that I could actually process it, enjoy it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, just choke myself. <clears throat> and, and humming, humming actually stimulates your vagus nerve. Um, and so that's a really good way to also um, turn off your fight or flight. <clears throat> All right, next one. Georgie asks, what's the go with constant peeing? If I drink one lit liter, I instantly pee out two liters. Not absorbing anything. I don't know where all the pee is coming from. <clears throat> this only comes on sometimes. I usually drink two liters a day fine, but this is an adrenal thing, and will it settle down if my adrenals do? Thank you. All right, Georgie. So... Again, this is like my true story right here. When I first started getting sick, I had initially gone to my primary care and she had just brushed me off and said, you're one of my healthiest patients, like poster child, there's nothing wrong with you. And I kept trying to tell her I'm exhausted, I'm exhausted. Um, and I'm just not myself and I can't process things that are going on. And I am peeing a lot. And she was like, no, you're fine, you're fine. So like, I have to really stand my ground and say, no, like I am peeing four times a night and I have to go multiple times during the day. I mean, I was to a point, my kid's school is 25 minutes from where I live. And I literally would pee right before I left the house. And then I would go pee as soon as I got in their carpool line, I would drop them off, then I would park, I would go in and pee, and then make it back. Like, I couldn't even make that 25-minute drive um, without having to stop. And she was like, no, you're fine, you're fine. Well, anyways, long story short, she reluctantly ends up um, sending me to urogynecology to get checked out. And urogynecology does this ultrasound, and they're like, oh, everything looks fine. Like, you know, there's no issues. You're retaining a little bit of urine, but you're fine. Um, there's nothing wrong. And they're like, just do a diary. They had me keep a log for three days, exactly the amount of fluid that was going in and the amount of fluid that was coming out. So I had to measure it. I had to measure what I drank, um, anything, whether it was tea, coffee, water, juices, whatever. I had to measure it and how many ounces I was drinking and then how many ounces I was urinating out. And they were like, you should be fine, but we'll just you know, send us your log. So I do this log for three days, and I'm not kidding you. The first day, I took in 126 ounces of fluid, and I peed out 127 ounces of fluid. I couldn't believe it. I recalculated those totals over and over. I was just shocked. And the second day, I was like, okay, maybe that was me. Same thing. Second day, 125 ounces that I um, took in, and 123 I peed out. I was just shocked. And then the third day, kind of the same results. And so I sent them this log and the nurse calls me and she goes, are you sure this is correct? I said, this is absolutely correct. Um, and she couldn't believe it. And I said, I know, I've been telling you. Um, long story short, they bounced me around from practitioner to practitioner and found nothing wrong with me, nothing. They still kept telling me you were perfectly fine. It was not till I started working with a functional medicine practitioner that we discussed all of this and I said to them, I think it's my adrenals. And they said, I think you might be right. Um, and so yes, so when your adrenals are overstressed, they produce a lot of cortisol. And so with that cortisol comes this incessant amount of urination. And so really what you need to do is calm your adrenals down and help them heal. And so once you help them heal, um, hopefully that should decrease the amount of urination. The other thing that is tied in with the adrenals is the OAT axis, which is something I've talked about in the lives before, um, ovarian adrenal thyroid axis. Always, or no, I shouldn't say always, but usually when one of them, which is the adrenals, is out of whack, it's going to take down one or the other or both. So it's going to take down the ovarian and the thyroid um, axis as well. And so for me, my adrenals were completely shot, completely shot. Um, and then it took down my ovaries. And so then my hormone levels were down to zero, like complete and utter. Um, they diagnosed me as premature. Um, oh, sorry. They di diagnosed me as very early menopause. I was 40 years old and 
I just couldn't believe it. I, I kept telling the doctors, I am not in menopause. This is um, something else. This is an inflammatory you know, thing. And they were like, nope, the numbers show it. You're in menopause. We know it's a hard pill to swallow, blah, blah, blah. So my advice then, you know, like based on, again, everything that I went through is to really start working with a practitioner. I know you have, I think you've already downloaded the 10 step guide if I remember correctly, but really those are the steps that I did every single day. And I mean consistently, every day, whether I was feeling better or not, whether I saw any changes or not, those are the things that I did um, to start making myself feel better and start healing my adrenals. And the other thing is, and I think I mentioned this to you last time as well, lemon water with salt every single morning. Even now, like a couple of weeks ago, my adrenals felt pretty wiped out. For about three weeks, I just did lemon water with salt, um, or it's called an adrenal cocktail, where it's like lemon water with salt and a pinch of cream of tartar for the potassium. And that really helps start healing your adrenals. And you also need high doses of vitamin C and zinc and quercetin. And um, I put all of that in that 10-step that guide. So I hope that helps. Um, I, I think for me, the general rule of thumb is... Um, at least drinking, you know, half your body weight in water is a minimum. So if you weigh, you know, 140 pounds, then you want to at least have 70 ounces of water per day. And then, of course, you'll have additional things like coffee. And uh, if I did a protein shake, then I would count that as well, um, that kind of stuff. But definitely half your body weight in water every single day. And then, you know, from that point on, uh, anything else is extra. So hope that helps, Georgie. Um, Rachel asks, hello, my daughter had high levels of ox A after mold exposure from our neighbor. We since left that home, but my daughter experienced unilateral hearing loss that I'm assuming is from the mold since it was at the same time. Are you aware of a connection between mold and hearing loss? Any ideas what I could try to help regain her hearing? So First thing I'm going to say, Rachel, is that I cannot give medical advice, um, not only just based on the fact that I'm PT, but in general, I don't know your child, their medical history, or any of that stuff, so I, I couldn't give you medical advice. But what I am going to tell you is that, again, you know, more from an educational perspective, that if you were exposed to mold, then chances are that there's very high levels of inflammation going on, and Unfortunately, when you have high levels of inflammation, one of the, um, the systems that is affected the most is the neurologic system. And so, you know, you, you guys have probably heard this. I saw it. I heard it. My MRI scans looked horrible um, for a young, young person. And they basically, it affects the neurological systems the most. And that includes the brain and the nerves and things like that. So, again, I'm not a practitioner, so I can't give you this advice, but to me, you know, I would think along the lines of inflammation, did, you know, some inflammation really affect one of the nerves to the hearing, you know, like um, structures and things like that. You'd have to work with a functional medicine practitioner. Um, I would say that stick to your gut. You know, she, you're thinking that this is coming from the mold because it was at the same time. Like I said earlier on, like I just didn't believe the fact, even though I was told over and over that you're in menopause, I didn't believe that fact because to me that was not menopause not at 40 years old my mom had perimenopause at 57 um, and sometimes you have a really good instinct about yourself anyway so if you feel that that's where it's coming from then you know you really need to be treated by a functional medicine practitioner who works with mold who knows how to treat mold um, and to really figure out a way like was a nerve damaged with the inflammation was um did something happen with centers of the brain um was there you know some um hypertrophy hypertrophy you know of the brain and things like that um that you need to be addressing and then from that point on you know there's certain parts of the brain that are responsible for the hearing centers and speech centers and things like that so you really need to do a deeper dive into this um to see what could be done to help your child regain their their hearing um, Rachel also asked, I'm curious to see if you've heard of upregulating the body's natural production of glutathione. I sent a friend request, but hoping I can jump on messenger with you sometimes to get your thoughts. My family is healing from old illness. So one thing I will tell you guys, I'm so sorry, but I cannot accept all the friend requests. Um, and I know I've been getting quite a few. 
I try my best to address things from an educational perspective, but I am not allowed to talk about specific cases, you know, and your child and your family member or yourself without knowing your medical history and all of the you know things that come with that. So unfortunately, I'm not able to, but what I can tell you, again, on this forum, is, which is where I could probably answer some educational questions or educational support, um, absolutely, your body can really naturally regulate um, the production of glutathione, especially if you were someone like me, as I men mentioned very, very early on in my illness. I could not tolerate any supplements. I could not tolerate even a drop of glutathione. It made me so sick. Um, and so some of the things that you can do for glutathione um, production is, like I said, I talked about this earlier, is coffee enemas. Like, don't quote me on the statistic, but it's like 3,000% increase in natural glutathione because of the dilation of the bile ducts and all that, The you know, going to the liver. Um, the hepatic portal vein goes directly to the liver. So it really increases glutathione production by a pretty significant amount to do enemas. Um, the other thing is like just uh, diet. So like sulforaphane is just an excellent, excellent um, supplement. And it's made from, you know, things like broccoli and stuff like that, cruciferous vegetables. Um, and so the one that I've used a lot previously is, is Brocco Protect. Um, it's just more of a natural supplement that's made out of broccoli. Um, but then cruci cruciferous vegetables, broccoli and cauliflower and cabbage and really things that very naturally will increase your glutathione production on its own is also very, very helpful. Um, so yes, the body is amazing. You can heal your body with diet. Um, and I know in the past I've talked about many people that have done that and changed their life um, just by changing, like completely changing their diet and really, really introducing a lot of phytonutrients and antioxidants and really helping the enzymes in their bodies to help with all the cycles and help with all the processes that take place. So yes, you can, I did it. I, it took me a very long time to be able to handle, um, you know, glutathione or, you know, now I can handle any of that very, very well. The other thing, um, that I think might be also a good suggestion that I did, and was it was very difficult to handle it in the beginning, but as I got better, is milk thistle. Um, the same link that I put earlier on for Global Healing, um, I use their milk thistle and I still do, um, and I really, really like it. It helped a lot with just kind of helping detoxify the liver in a gentle way. Um, I tried other ones and it just didn't work well for me, but this one is just very pure and very, um, um, clean and organic products and all of that so that really helped a lot as well um katie asks what is your favorite portable sauna with low to no emf and same with red light therapy and do you eat dairy so my portable sauna and i don't have a link um written up for that one but the one i use and i have no affiliation with any of these is higher dose so i'm gonna write sauna blanket and it's um it's called higher dose i remember because again i've had mine for quite a while so if you you know i remember back then doing a lot of research on it uh and i know ben greenfield has done a lot of research on it too um the biohacker that i told told you i follow and I do think that I, back then I remember looking it up and it was very low EMF because I was very sensitive to EMF. Uh, and so, yes, I really like that one. Now, there's so many out there. Again, this is with a caveat that I bought mine, you know, quite a while ago, um, five years ago, maybe. Um, so really just, uh, you know, do your homework. And then as far as red light therapy, um, I do that every single day and um, that's the one I use is Juve so I'll just say red light therapy um, is Juve again no affiliation whatsoever with them either um, it's just something that I've used red light therapy for about three years I really do think that it's helped me quite a bit especially calming my inflammation down helping my mitochondria um, and really helping with some detoxification and things like that. Uh, I know I've talked about studies previously where um, red light therapy really helps increase estradiol production, um, and it's definitely been true for me, so I really do enjoy my red light therapy, and I try to do it at least four or five times every night, like four or five times a week at night, 
because in the morning it's just so crazy rush for me I think it is a little better to do it in the morning to get the red light into your eyes and all of that but for me the mornings are crazy rushed with kids and stuff so um, I do mine before bed and it works very well for me do I eat dairy <sighs> maybe 0.1% uh, even that I've really cut down when I got really sick um, one of the first things I did was to go gluten-free and I wasn't seeing that much of a difference so then I became gluten-free and dairy-free and I think I did that for a good two years where I was completely vegan and completely gluten-free um, it was very tough on my system and then um, I slowly started eating just a little bit of dairy but when I say just a little bit I mean like I would just have organic homemade yogurt every night with my food because I eat a lot of lentils and, and things like that and so at night I would have maybe quarter cup of yogurt homemade organic yogurt with my lentils and stuff and I just it's just something I really needed and then once I started LDN in September um, I think I've told you guys I had a terrible like the first three months were very very tough for me with LDN it was helping me a lot um, but I was just having a tough time with the side effects and so then I just decided to become my own advocate and when I when my practitioner told me to stop it I crashed and I didn't do well at all um, and then I restarted a month later and I decided to become my own advocate and say okay what is the one thing that is just could be affecting me um, and it was the dairy you know I ate dairy in the evening for dinner and then I would take my LDN three four hours later at night but still it was just affecting me to a point where it was just intolerable and so then I completely stopped yogurt as well and so in the past two weeks I've tried a little bit of cottage cheese um, because I really like to keep my protein um, numbers high I try to get a lot of protein in every day and so I tried some cottage cheese but I don't think it was working well with me I'm not lactose intolerant I've never had a problem with milk it's just the you know years after I got sick um, that I was just having more sensitivities to dairy and yogurt so I can't say that I'm going to fully go back. I definitely am not going to go back to eating gluten, um, but I don't think that I'm going to fully be able to eat dairy, especially because I'm on LDN and I just think that it has better effects if uh, I'm off the LDN, if I'm off the dairy. Um, Tammy asks, uh, let me see here. Tammy asks, hormones, question mark. I became postmenopausal quick. Is there anything natural that you can do? I absolutely know this is an issue for me playing in my chronic health issues. I have aged so quickly and don't even recognize myself in the mirror. I am so afraid to take hormone replacement as I had typical, as I had atypical lumps removed from my breast and told that I'm high risk for breast cancer. So hard to know what to do. My doctor gave me a cream and a prescription for progesterone, which I have not started yet. I was told I have zero estrogen. Any suggestions? Uh, so, um, Tammy, I think I had mentioned to you that I was going to tell you my story. Um, and I kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier on, but my first sign of illness was just that I was exhausted and fatigued. And if I worked out, I was swollen for days. My joints hurt. I couldn't move. I just was bedridden very quickly early on. And I must have gone through maybe four or five different practitioners who kept telling me um, that I was fine, that I was fine. And I went to two primary cares two endocrinologists, two rheumatologists, and two hepatologists, all in that seven months. And they were, they all said I was fine, completely fine. And yet I was bedridden, could not drive, could not empty a dishwasher, could not, um, you know, take my kids to school. Like I just couldn't do anything. And they kept telling me I'm fine. And so then my really, really good friend, she's an endocrinologist. She saw me this sick and she said, you know, Z, we don't normally do female hormones um, as an endocrinologist. It's usually your OBGYN that does it. Um, but she's like, I'll run your hormones anyways. And I was like, yeah, go ahead. You know, I'm super young. I was very young at the time, 30-something, um, maybe 38 or 39. You know, I was very young. And um, and uh, uh, she said, I'm just going to do it. I said, yeah, you're probably not going to find anything. But what the heck, you know, at this point, I've done everything. She calls me 7 a.m. the next morning, and she was like, Zankna, you are in full-blown menopause. And I was like, excuse me? She's like, your numbers look horrible. And I was like, how is that possible? She's like, you are in full-blown menopause. Now, I had been having like irregular periods and I was having just a lot of hot flashes, but we were going through such a stressful time that I just attributed it to that and never really quite thought of it. Um, 
and I did have an ablation the year before because of that, the irregularity and all that stuff. And I think that was a big mistake as well. Um, and in any case, so then I went to see an OBGYN and the OBGYN was just shocked. She was like, these are numbers of a 58 year old. You are 39, you are in full blown menopause. So yes, like exactly your story. I became post menopausal very quickly. Um, between getting sick and then you know being diagnosed with full-blown menopause like postmenopausal not peri nothing postmenopausal and i just was shocked and so then i refused to believe it because my mom went into perimenopause at 57 years old and it's usually related you know for the most part um barring really bad health issues but it's usually related when you will go into menopause and then I just refused to believe it. Not because I didn't want to believe it, but I just said there is a reason. There is a reason that my adrenals have shut down, that my ovaries have now shut down. Like this is all connected. And that sent me down this cascade of learning about my adrenals and learning about my you know, OAT axis, ovarian adrenal thyroid axis, and all of that stuff. Even the friend that ended up diagnosing me at that point, the endocrinologist, um, she also did start me on thyroid medication, which I stopped in six weeks. I hated it. It didn't do too well on it. Um, and so, yeah, so when one of those, um, it's like a bar stool. When one of the legs is broken, you're going to really affect the other two. And if I remember your story correctly, Tammy, you actually healed and you actually got better and were running for three, four miles and doing very, very well. And then you got sick again. So for you, I would say two big things fix your adrenals and fix the OAT axis. Like that's going to be the number one, you know, thing for you with your foundation. And you can, you know, work with a functional medicine practitioner, um, you know, or like if you really don't want to, I wrote this link down for you, but I've had many um, patients do um, the salivary um, ZRT lab test where you don't need a doctor's orders. You just go to, um, I think this is the correct one. You go to um, zrtlabs.com and you um, order the saliva kit and it measures your four point cortisol and it measures your um, it measures your uh, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and then it gives you this whole write up. And I got my ZRT lab test from a uh, pharmacy, like a compounding pharmacy. And so I know her very well. So she will, she also at the time had helped me interpret the results and things like that. Um, but you know, they do send you a written report, which really you do need a practitioner to help you kind of, um, read those results. But if they are telling you that you have no estrogen and no progesterone, I don't know how old you are, Tammy, but I will tell you for me, like I had said this my whole life, I'm a really, really healthy person and really, really, um, clean eater exercise. So I had always said this, that when I got into menopause, I was not going to do any exogenous hormones, like any hormone replacement. I wasn't going to do anything because I'm just such a natural person. Um, I did not know that those are the cards that I was going to be dealt with, with this chronic illness and all of that. And so then ended up having this premature ovarian failure is what they said to me after the menopause diagnosis was thrown at me for a few years. But um, premature ovarian failure um, was the diagnosis that they gave me. And at the time, they then said to me that, yes, you're against hormones. But if you don't take hormones, there's so much other data out there for women who will not, you know, replenish with estrogen, progesterone. Not only do you develop osteoporosis, but you are high risk for cardiovascular disease. So as long as you're doing bioidentical hormones, I really recommend that you follow your doctor's advice. If they've given you the prescription, I really recommend because the disadvantages and the dangers of not taking it are a lot more than the risks. So the, the risks outweigh the benefits in this case if you don't do it. Um, and so I really would follow the advice from your doctor. Um, and in my opinion, like I just, at that point, I refused to take any birth control pill just because again, I'm a very natural person. And so then I searched and searched until I could find someone who would prescribe bioidentical hormones. And it was a estrogen cream and a progesterone cream and um, testosterone cream and all of that stuff and um, I had mentioned this 
I think it wasn't the last time, but it was a time before that I was going to have some good news for you guys um, and let you guys know. So I had been on BHRT for um, uh, bioidentical hormone replacement therapy for over four years. And the last um, six or eight months, I wasn't tolerating it at all. And I kept telling my practitioners, I kept telling my doctors that it's too high. The dose is too high. So last year, we cut down the dose in half. And then by October, especially after I started LDN and things like that, by October, um, I had to go down again in the dose. And so what I was telling and I was mentioning to, I think David asked that question, not this slide, not the last slide, but the one before, that I would have some good news. And I didn't want to just spill the beans because I wanted to be sure. But we did um, the blood work month prior and I'm completely producing my own estrogen, my own progesterone. I'm ovulating again, everything back to normal and then I didn't want to say anything just because I wanted to be sure and then on May 6th which was last week um, I got my blood levels drawn again and sure enough that's like three cycles in a row where I'm producing my own estrogen my own progesterone um, and so you know my ovaries are waking up again the inflammation after all these years has gone down and my ovaries are waking up again and so what did I do to help achieve this I can't even tell you. It was a very, very disciplined lifestyle for five years or so, um, four years, five years. But I'm a very clean eater. Um, I eat a variety of phytonutrients and colors of the rainbow every single day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, lots of greens, reds, orange. I mean, I make it a point to get a lot of phytonutrients throughout the day. I eat very high amounts of protein and high amounts of fat. Um, you know, don't fear fat because people say, oh, you know, low fat diet, this, that. I don't do low fat anything, but I eat a good amount of fats um, just because fats are very beneficial for inflammation and decreasing inflammation. And then for four or five years, I've done all these treatments, detox. I regularly did liver flushes, coffee enemas. I did um, all the... Um, sauna and cold plunges and um, earthing and I did um, the PEMF mat and I mean I just I basically targeted in my body how to deal with inflammation how to deal with insulin resistance which happens as a cause of stress I had to heal my adrenals it was such a long process and if anyone else like especially my husband was like, wow, you are so disciplined and so dedicated. And it finally paid off. It finally paid off um, that I was able to now, after four years, get off all the estrogen, progesterone, whereas doctors and OBs and everyone had told me that I'm in full-blown menopause, like this is it. It doesn't reverse at this point. I wasn't willing to take that answer because I knew that was not the case. So I hope that gives you hope because I told you I want to really talk to you about this story. Um, and how my personal experience with it and how it is physically possible to do um, and to reverse it. Now, I don't know how old you are, and I, again, do not know any of your medical history, but what I can tell you is that, A, please follow your doctor's advice, like if they've given you cream and progesterone and please start it, you really will start to feel better in three months because that is a big cause of that bar stool going off balance. Um, if you downloaded my 10-step guide, I say it in there specifically. You have to fix your adrenals and you have to balance your hormones. It is the key to start feeling better um, and you really need to do it. So follow your doctor's advice, you know, do what they're telling you about estrogen, progesterone, doses to take, etc. Um, it takes a few months. It doesn't happen right away. Um, but then really, really focus on a uh, anti-inflammatory lifestyle, uh, detox, detoxification lifestyle, um, eat clean organic foods and really cut down your stress levels, you know, exercise or walk or whatever it is that you can do. The cold plunges for me, I've been doing the cold plunges for three or four years in ice cold water. That's been really good. Um, and so yes, it, it changed for me and, uh, it was a huge, huge achievement for me. So I really appreciated, um, that you know my hard work paid off so um my goodness we've run over and i feel like i could keep talking more and more i don't know if you guys want to keep listening to more and more um i see that there's so many comments is it the liver cleanse program yes the liver cleanse pro program is 
the link that I put up there. How long does it take to do? So it's a five day program um, and you're eating normally those five days, but you're eating very healthy, very clean um, salads and like, you know, just clean organic food. You really should avoid meat and eggs and things like that for those five days. It's all in the booklet and it's a whole program and they tell you when to take the, the milk thistle, the turmeric, you know, everything's included in there. And then on the last day you take Epsom salt, um, and then you take um, olive oil. It's like eight ounces of olive oil. It all comes in that box. And it's just, for me, it was a great program. Um, what do you do if you don't sweat, Rosalie? I mean, you just have to wait. You just have to take it slow like I did. I didn't sweat for six months at all. And I did that sauna every single day, the blanket, the infrared blanket, um, every single day. I just had to keep at it. And when I started sweating, I took pictures. I have pictures of me finally sweating um, because I was just so excited. Teresa says, I'm so sensitive. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm there with you. Teresa asked, did you purchase a liver package? Yes, I do purchase that whole package uh, every time. And it's there's no liver flush, it's the liver cleanse, I'm sorry. Yes, it's called the liver cleanse. Elizabeth says, so the Shoemaker Protocol did not help you? I don't know how to quantify that because I was very sick, but what I did tell, what I will tell you is that I'm a really disciplined person. And so, yes, I did follow it all the way through till for six months. And by the end of it, I couldn't tolerate the VIP. I couldn't tolerate the um, well call. I just felt sicker and sicker. And that was when I decided to take matters in my own hands. And I did a medically supervised six day water only fast. Um, and there's also like studies on this. You can actually look it up. But um, when you do a water only fast, you increase your VIP production, I think by like 300%. Uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's you know something like that, which I was doing the VIP spray and felt horrible on it but this is your body's natural way so again this was medically supervised though guys you cannot do it on your own um and so i don't know if i can say it didn't help me but i certainly know that by the end of it i felt so terrible that i had to stop i finished it i went all the way through and i finished it for six months but um i don't know if that was a big part of my healing i think other, a lot of other things helped more um I think Georgie says, I think I have mold toxicity as well, and it's related to frequent urination. Absolutely. But really the premise and the, the thing behind it is that it affects your adrenals. It affects your hormones. Your ovaries are taken out. Your adrenals are taken out. And so, yes, that's what happened to me is that then that was a cascade of the frequent urination. Uh, Portia says, how do you find that out? I'm losing so much weight with no solution. I think it's my thyroid. I mean, you're going to have to work with a practitioner, Portia. Otherwise, I, I did put that link. I mean, maybe you can, you know, do the ZRT um, hormone and cortisol testing and then have a practitioner review it with you and maybe they can help you. What did the MRI say? Oh, I was devastated when I first saw my MRI. I had the amount of, um, of um, brain shrinking that I had, cortical um, hypertrophy that I had. It was devastating i could not believe that for a 38 year old um it was pretty bad i did the great vicky says i did the great plains test and it said nothing in my case um you know i mean i don't know again vicky i'm not a practitioner like a physician to give you this advice but maybe you don't have the hla gene you know the mthfr gene so you are detoxifying while living in mold um, I know families where five people, only one is really affected or two are affected. The other three are completely normal when living in mold. So a lot of it has to do with your, um, with your um, detoxification and your MTHFR genes and all of that. Um, all right, guys, I, I, there's so many more questions. But um, just remember, guys, if you have any more questions or if I didn't get to them today, Please, please put them under the um, under the the image that I put for the questions, so I have quickly can refer to them and I will answer your questions. I really, really love doing these lives. I mean, I just could keep talking, and and I'm sure you guys need to get going at this point. So thank you so much again for all the support, for all your love, and I really, really wish you guys a happy healing journey. And we will meet next Tuesday at 7 p.m. Take care, guys.